Good morning. We're back. Uh, this is the Vermont House Appropriations Committee. It is Thursday, January 19th, 2023. It is a little bit after 10, and we uh, have um, to ourselves the RAND report and those that put it together for us to hear. We, we heard in the Joint Committee yesterday, and now they are, um, made themselves available to all the committees that wanted to hear from them uh, directly so that we can ask some questions on that. So I would have if you have either up on your screen or the uh, report and uh, we'll hear and then we'll ask some questions. But first, we'll introduce ourselves because you didn't get to meet us formally. So uh, I will start. I'm Representative Diane Lanfer. I live in Virgins and I represent Addison 3. Hi, good morning, welcome. I'm Robin Shy, and I'm from Middlebury. I'm Pat Brennan, I'm from Colchester. I'm Seth Lilly, I'm from Burlington. Tristan Tillman, I'm from Bradford. Carrie Dillon from Wastefield. Lynn Dickinson, I represent St. Holmes Town. Trevor Squirrel, representing Underhill and Jericho. Woody Page, Newport. Jim Harrison, I represent <coughs> the town of Chittenden and a few others nearby. Rebecca Holcomb from Sharon Stratford, Norwich and Bethlehem. And then we have Aaron as our committee assistant. We have our JFO members, um, Maria, Nolan, and I'm sure uh, others. So please introduce yourself for the record and your team, sir. Sure. Uh, my name is Christopher Das. I'm a policy researcher at the RAND Corporation. Um, joined via Zoom by Lynn Harrelly, who's a senior economist at RAND, and Aaron Strong, who's a senior economist at RAND. Um, no, Lynn and Aaron, did you want to say hi? <clears throat> Just for the record, Aaron Strong. And uh, for the record, Lynn Carolee. And uh, just a personal shout out to family in Thetford, Stratford, and Norwich. <laughs> <laughs> There's zero degrees of separation. <laughs> I dated somebody from Rutland at one point. Oh. <laughs> now we're covered. When you're ready, sir, please. Uh, did you want me to? I'm not sure how this is. Do you want me to answer questions or did you want me to do? To, do well, we heard your presentation yesterday. If you, you might want to spark our mind a little bit because we will we jump all over the place in subjects and get us dialed back in. Sure, I'll give you the 30,000 foot overview yep. of what we did. And, and so um, what we tried to do um, is, is answer two charges from Act 45. The first was to say what would the cost of a high quality pre-kindergarten system that's available to everybody who wants to take advantage of it cost. Um, and then part two said, given how much money that we have in the system, how much money that we have that it's going to cost, what is the, the amount of funds that we need to make up with the public, with public funds, where, what are some possibilities that could be used as sources of revenue for those funds? Um, and then given that, what is going to be the effect on the overall Vermont economy? And so what I presented yesterday was um, how we built that, that cost estimate of what a full ECE system would look like in Vermont. Um, what we did was we looked at all the inputs to what the research points as a high quality early childhood education system. Um, we costed out those resources. Uh, we then looked at all the different revenue streams that are currently providing funds into the ECE system in Vermont. We subtracted that out. Um, and then we created uh, six scenarios where you subsidize people um, of various income. And we estimated how much money they would contribute to, their, to the system under those various subsidy, con those subsidy schedules. Um, and then we simply took our total costs, subtracted out the money that's already in the system, subtracted out the money that we would anticipate people would, would uh, contribute based on the different subsidy systems, and that less of, less of, left us the gap. And so we give you gaps that range from the least generous subsidy system, that's around $190 million per year. Um, and if the most uh, generous subsidy systems we modeled would have gaps around $280 million per year in 2022 dollars. Um, we then put those numbers and said, how can we, you know, how could you possibly find sources of revenue for those, <coughs> those gaps? And so um, we modeled about six options, about six different taxes for you. Happy to go through any of those options that you 
um, would like. Um, we found in general that um, effects on, on economic well-being would be about would be small. Uh, it would grow the Vermont economy um, between uh, sixty and at the number by, between sixty and one hundred, maybe eighty million per year. Um, and that you'd have increasing in um, sales and tax revenue from about 1.5 to 18 million per year. Um, and then we estimate that about 600 to 2,800 people will enter the workforce um, due to the, to the subsidies, depending on the situations that we modeled. Representative Harrison has a question, then Representative Shai. Can I ask a couple? Of course. Okay. You have the floor, sir. Um, so looking through the report or the summary, there's a figure in there of Six hundred and forty-five million, uh, I think. Yes. And that was what was first flashed up on one of the news media. Yeah, uh, that that is a really big number. Large number. Um, and but then as I'm reading it, it sounded like that's the total cost, but we're already paying for some of that. So <laughs> tell me how to how do you figure out what we're paying? Is this what um, parents might be paying? Is that include like what parents pay? <clears throat> And then you subtract that out, uh, or help, help me understand that big number. And then how do you get down to, you know, the two hundred, you know, one hundred and eighty to two hundred eighty million dollars? Sure, absolutely. And I'll I'll share this slide, which I kind of uh, summarizes one of those numbers for one of the scenarios, because it's going to depend on the scenario, the subsidies, how generous of a subsidy schedule you want yeah. to. Um, in part, but so this top number here is that 645 million. So that's the total cost of a high quality ECE system, and we anticipate the additional demand that people would have for that high cost. So high regardless cost. of who's paying for it, regardless of who's paying for it, that's okay. that's the top line number. Okay. Um, currently, this this third box that's maroon, that is the amount of money that's currently in the system. So these are funds from the federal government that fund things like Head Start. Um, these are state funds that fund the current universal pre-kindergarten system in Vermont. Um, so these are all, and then these are the, the funds that go into the current subsidy system, CCFAP, the Child Care Financial Assistance Program. So we're already paying $260 million between federal and state? Uh, $125 million. That's the third box. $125 million. Yeah. Okay. So the family contribution depends on how the, the how generous a subsidy schedule are. So this is one subsidy schedule that we think hews closely to the spirit of Act 45. Um, and so what we did is we said, under this situation, how much would uh, people demand health care, uh, uh, demand, uh, demand child care? So how many people would enter the system? Yeah. Given the subsidy schedule, how much would they have to contribute out of their pocket? And then we added that up, and so that's the $260 million number. So the subsidy schedules wouldn't cover all costs for everybody, right, just depending on, on your income. So we anticipate that under this schedule, $260 million would come from families. And so, so if you take that, subtract it from 645. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm a little slow. Um, yeah. So the 125 would be, say, approximately one third, <clears throat> if you, towards the higher end, of what the new number would be. So the new number is 250, in this scenario is 258. Plus the 125? No, nope, just two, the 258 is the gap. So what, under this yes. scenario, you take the total cost, right, the 645, that's how much it's gonna cost. Yeah. You already have 125 million in the system, so take that out. Families are gonna contribute 260. Okay, I'm not taking it out, so that's, that's why we're disagreeing on the numbers. Right, so, so, so the goal here is- 125 stays. Yes. 125 stays, it's not. Right, it's just sure, not sorry, there. yes, yes, yes. The 125 stays in the system. When I take it out, I mean, if you want to calculate what's left over that we have to fund additionally. Okay, so the existing public subsidy, state or federal, is about one third of the new subsidy, state or federal. Half. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Just an, another yeah, way. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Just yes, my head sure, works. absolutely. Right. Okay, um, the number of new employees that you project is how much? Uh, depending on the situation, between 600 and 2,800. 600? To 20, 2,800. Depending on the, the more generous subsidy schedules will have more people enter the labor force. Okay, and how many new employees are going to be needed in child care sector? That's a, that's a good question. Lynn, do you have an estimate of, of that? I do not. We do not generate that, that number. It's possible to do so. Um, but they did 
um, generate that estimate. I mean, we know there's a shortage right now. Sure. I mean, people can't get in, and, and obviously, hopefully, one of the goals of this is to make sure we have enough child care slots <coughs> through staffing. Um, and I'm, I'm just trying to understand if <coughs> pick a number. Let's say we we were going to create or bring 2,000 people back to the workforce that can't make it work today, right? Um, and if we need 1,500 in the child care industry, we're gaining a net of 500 for other employers, right? Whether that's government, whether it's private or commercial. So it kind of begs the question, what's the cost of those 500 net gain? The cost? Uh, oh, if you want to take all the costs and, and go into the net gain? I mean, we all want a bigger workforce. Yes. And but everything has got to be balanced between cost and benefit. Sure. Um, and I'm just. So the so way I guess the way I'm we kind of trying to zero. Yeah. Down. So yeah. the way the way we kind of look at it when we try to model the whole economy, right? Which I think is also what you're trying to keep in mind, um, is we say how many net entrants are gonna gonna happen, right? And so. You know, maybe 22,000 people are going to enter the workforce, right? Some of them may go into ECE. If you pay ECE workers higher wages, that might draw somebody from another part of the, the sector into it, right? But on the balance, about about 2,000, let's say, given your scenario, is going to enter the workforce. The way we look at it from kind of a, a really high level is like, now that you have more workers, what benefit? How will that grow the Vermont economy as a whole? And that that's what we modeled that the first state product would have, you know. On the short end, maybe 59 million, maybe on the high end, over 200 million. And so that's kind of how we look at it instead of trying to parcel out movements from one sector to another and then look at those costs. That's not quite how economists look at it. Yeah. So that might be, make more sense to you as a representative. Yeah. And, and, and it's a different lens. It's a, it's a lens right. depending yeah. on, you know, the, the good news is that there's positive. Yeah. Uh, and, and finally, and I'll, I'll shut up. Um, so you had a chart in there about current wages, and yes. I think child care was like just under fifteen dollars an hour. Yes, I can bring that chart up for you. Let me give you one second. Um, Page nine of your remarks. Page nine of, oh yeah, we just, yeah, here we go. What, what I wanted to I mean, Go ahead, please. Oh, yeah, no, that's not There's right. There's no that's question oh, okay. that we would have a shortage based on those wages today. I mean, even McDonald's has signs up $17 an hour or more. I mean, that whole service sector is really being squeezed. And it's not just the service sector, you get into health care, <coughs> it's squeezed in different areas. So I, I get it. Um, you know, we need to be competitive. Does your proposal, when you talk about the total cost, does it include bringing those average wages up and mm -hmm. to what? Yeah. So that's a great question. And so this is the current um, hourly wage for child care workers, right, which is which is pretty, pretty low, like you said. And, yeah. and pre-COVID, that creates the pressures of the system. And then once COVID happened, right, that created even more instability of the, in the system. So we do model increases in wages. Um, and if you bear with me, I can get you to that. And so these become the new increases in wages that we model. So we assume increases in credentials as well. So that lead teachers would have a bachelor's degree and associate degrees. But those would be the medium wages. And those are more comparable to, let's say, a kindergarten teacher. OK. And so you say it assumes that 26% fringe benefit of those. And that's the same teachers. Those are the, the cash salaries. But in the model, we embed, embed a 26% for Yes. Okay. yes. And what do, you, what do we have currently for average benefit? It depends very, it varies a lot. And but so but there are some that provide none, and there are some that provide some. So it's kind of hard to say with the average. I don't know. Do, Lynn, do we have an average statistic? It's, it's pretty low if there is any. Yeah. There, there may be something from national data, but I'm not aware of anything that Vermont has collected that would tell you that. It's, it's not in the same government data that allows us to look at 
cash compensation does not collect data on um, non-wage benefits. Um, so we mostly know about cash compensation and not the benefit structure. Okay, but I would think you would to come up with a total number you would need to have a So idea. that's correct. And so yeah. that's the 26% fringe rate models a series of um, benefits that in that we talk about in the report, mm -hmm. things like um, 30, 30 days off for personal vacation, um, all the, uh, you know, retirement plans, um, health insurance, dental, paid both by the employee and the employer. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll be quiet for now. No, it's good. Okay, good. Uh, Representative Shai. Thanks, and I'll follow up with some similar questions. Uh, so following on that same slide that you just had up, oh. the lead teacher at 69,420, that does not include the fringe benefits is what I'm hearing you say, is that correct? So you have to add 26%. That's and right. if I look at elementary school teachers, their mean is 63,000. So you're, this is $6,000 more. Uh, the, these are in 2022 dollars. Uh, Lynn, do you, is that correct? Yeah. A couple oh, points. One is that um, in showing current wage data, just because that comes out with a lag, that's in 2019 dollars. Um, in terms of these compensation levels, because we're modeling costs in 2022 dollars, there is that difference. But I think the other important difference is that we're assuming these teachers oh. in early care and education settings are working full time year round. And so this is what they'd earn annually. The teacher salaries are typically based on an academic year. Um, so there's that difference in the number of hours represented okay. in an annual salary. Um, okay, is coming. that helps me. So this is really a fully loaded compensation package that you put in your model with 30 days of CTO and dental and vision and <clears throat> all of those things that are being offered. That's the fully loaded top of the line. It's, it is is what it is. I, the, the way we read Act 45 is that you wanted com compensation, which includes cash and benefits yeah. that's commensurate to other people with the same credentials and experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so that would be comparable for, let's say, okay. like a kindergarten teacher who would have the right. same types of So I wanted, I wanted to just be sure everybody understands that that's what you have done. Yes. And you have put this, have you graduated these numbers over four years? You said you had sort of a four year on ramp. So, so in your modeling, they don't start off with a lead teacher at 69,000 plus benefits. Do they, they start off lower and you gradually work up? Or what so did you do So what there? we modeled is just one situation and you can obviously look at different situations is we didn't model the um, a, a phase in of parts of the system. What we did is we modeled a phase in of the, of the gap, that, that amount. Okay. I think one way you can kind of think about that is you would maybe perhaps subsidize the lower end of the income distribution first in this fully funded DCE program, yeah. um, and then as you know, you as you phase it in more people up the income ladder until uh -huh. you get more into subsidy. You could phase it in perhaps with those types of things as well, but that's those types of details are kind of implementation details that we we thought you'd be best to okay. think through. Okay, and I want to go back to your uh, math with the six hundred forty-five million and the. Uh, um, I want to ask you about the 125 million that's existing public funding. What is the split currently between federal and state of that 125 million? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and I'll again share a slide where we kind of show that. So um, early head start, and these are in 2018, 19 dollars. So the, the, the one trick here is that um, these numbers add up to about 109 million because those are 2019 dollars. We inflate that to 125 million dollars because when we look at the right. gap, we want everything. So it's going to be slightly, slightly lower. But early Head Start and Head Start, which are fu federally funded, are about 22.3 million per year. Um, the Universal Pre-K program, which is state funded, is about 41 million per year. Um, and then CCFAP is both federal and state. And Lynn, do you know, I don't know if we know the ratio of federal to state within CCFAP. We don't have that breakdown. Right. Um, and so that's, that's a combination. Yes, and then the, the federal and state child uh, tax credits are um, 
are lower, but they are about seven and, and one, and then there's the Title I mules. Mm -hmm. So Title I is federal. Title I is, is federal. Okay, and the child tax credit, <coughs> does that, that's the child care tax credit. So yes. that doesn't include the child tax credit that we passed last year. Correct. It's not related. Okay, so we have, so after 125, we have at least 43 million plus whatever share of CCFAP. And we don't know what our share of CC staff is. Correct. So we have about a third of what's in there. Sort of. I, I, I wouldn't be able if to If you're trying to guess. dissect yeah. the 125. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying so, to figure yeah. out of the 125, the state's already putting in money. I'm trying to get a sense of the entire state picture. Yeah, so if you look at picture. all the federal minus CC fat, you're you're looking at maybe around thirty to thirty five million dollars per year. Well, pre K is forty one. That's state. <clears throat> That's what I mean. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm looking for what state is. Oh, state would be so forty one. So around forty three plus whatever CC fat. Is. Exactly. I'm sorry. Forty. I, I think we'll actually come out closer to 50-50 I think you're right. Yeah. About 50% state. state. Of the 125. Yeah. Of the 125. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm done for now. Thank you. All right, much. great. Anyone else? Just Representative Holcomb. Quick clarification. Um, I know that the ratios you used are much higher, I believe, than the ratios that we currently see in practice in the state of Vermont, but did you estimate how many new teachers would be necessary? to implement this fully funded EC model. No, so we were, yeah, we didn't model the number of new EC teachers specifically that we would need. Actually, the ratios that we used are consistent with licensing in Vermont. Oh, they're, um, the, and, they're the and the stars, pardon? They're the maximum ratios. Right. That's so, not relational. But, right. Yeah, so, um, and, uh, moreover, in the in the stars system is not tied to <laughs> achieving um, improved ratios as you move up the stars rating. So we use that um, baseline. Um, uh, what would be the licensing standard, but that's also consistent with what you would expect an accreditation agency to use as a ratio. Um, so it it is we're, we're viewing it as the high quality standard. Can, can I ask when? I know there's been some interesting work by people like Erica Frankenberg recently around the STARS and the idea of modeling subsidy rates and tying it to STARS as having disproportionate racial impacts and possibly socioeconomic impacts. Are you aware of that? And is that something you evaluated as well? Yeah, not familiar with that work, um, but more generally, um, states have moved toward using tiered reimbursement systems that are tied to quality rating such that providers that are higher on the rating scale have a higher per child reimbursement, whether it's at the infant, toddler, or preschool age. Um, one of the issues is which providers reach those higher quality rating levels and therefore are getting more, mm -hmm. spending more resources and getting more resources. And there can definitely be <clears throat> implications in terms of um, children based on income or race and ethnicity. Um, one of the things we did um, report on in um, some analysis we did of the state subsidy data was to look at whether children um, receiving CCFAP subsidies were any different in the quality ratings of the providers where they were being served compared to children who um, um, to the overall um, ratings. And generally, we weren't seeing that um, there was a difference as you moved up the income level within CCFAP, um, but we don't know where that necessarily where the children are beyond CCFAP at the higher income levels in, in terms of how they, how they compare. Are you good? I, I'll wait. I got this. I'll wait. Okay. Representative Dolan? Yes, thank you. Thank you for this report. It's, uh, I'm still trying to get through it, so <laughs> I appreciate it. I understand. Uh, just a couple of general questions, if I, if I may. Uh, all the way through the report, we do refer to quality, early childhood education. Do we have a definition of that in terms of what the criteria are, what the standards are, what we're looking for to help establish that kind of um, standard or gold standard that we're trying to achieve here for our 
That's, that's a great question. So we did model, um, we obviously chose com uh, uh, components that are consistent with the research base of what produces high quality ECE enough. I'll do the summary from the slides I presented yesterday. Um, so one of those things that we did model were the, the ratios or the group sizes. So how many, how many adults per child have to be in the room? Um, and so obviously the, the more, the fewer children per adult can be more expensive, but they get more individualized care. So one of the high quality, uh, 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 quality features would be uh, having uh, the ratios uh, that are consistent and, and what we remodeled. Um, another kind of cost driver is the teacher education. So we modeled having teachers having bachelor's and associate's degrees. We do this for, for a number of reasons. First, there are already a number of pre-K providers that require that, for example, Head Start. Um, if you look at the, uh, youth, the universal pre-kindergarten programs that are being instituted across the country, they also require it. And the theory behind this is that um, bachelor's degrees, and, and here we're specifically talking about ones in early childhood development and education, you know, the, the, a lot of the benefits that you get from early childhood, early childhood education is helping the child <clears throat> learn, right? There's a lot of development in the child's brain that happens before five. Um, but you have to be, you structure your, instru your instruction in ways to capitalize that and promote that, that, that benefit. And so you need instruction. The instructors need instruction on how to do that, and how to structure those learning experiences. And so going in these bachelor's or associate's degrees in, in that is a high quality indicator. Um, and then things like professional development, how can you make sure that their skills are, are refreshed and keep on with the, the latest? Do they have time off to plan? Um, so that they can actually plan the instruction well? Do they have access to high quality evidence-based curricula? Do they use developmental screeners so they understand what the level the child is so that they can tailor their instruction to where the child is? Um, same thing with formative assessments. Screeners also help you figure out if the child has special needs or is behind typically developing peers. Um, and then finally, for the STAR system, do you have independent assessors of quality um, looking at that, that whole bundle? So that's kind of how we envisioned what a high quality early childhood education system would look like, and that's what we cost it out. Thank you. And I'll just mention that these expectations, these requirements are consistent with Vermont's STARS rating system and five-star rating, including the direction we understand the revised system is, is considering. Thank you. May I ask a couple? Sure, it's my understanding. You didn't invent something new. This is what we have as our quality. It's our it's our standard. Yeah. It's our current standard. Yeah. Yes, and in some cases, current or future plan standards. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my next question is about uh, getting to um, Representative Harrison's point about workforce impacts. We are already at a deficit of not having uh, adequate workforce, and you can look at the number of open vacancies or, or the actual demand for childhood, um, early childhood education, and it's substantial, it's in the thousands. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we're suggesting here in this report, the, the, the models and the uh, outcomes are to include both um, to fill our current gap as well as how to achieve uh, our future. Um, quality of education to, to uh, raise the the opportunity for uh, for our workforce is it are we trying to accomplish both things today's gap as well as um, so is some this, of the other challenges we're facing? this would be the yeah this would be the cost kind of I guess assuming that we have the teachers and everything that we need, right? So probably this is not something that you can do tomorrow, right? You need to phase this in. And part of why you need to phase this in is that you have to build the workforce needed for this high quality ECE system. So things that are not included in this may be required are things like upskilling the current workforce, helping them achieve that bachelor's, um, building the capacity of universities and higher education institutions of Vermont to provide degree credentials that teach them the skills to provide the bachelor's and the associate's degrees. Um, so this is kind of seen an investment in the overall um, Vermont economy. So this is probably not something that you know you can you can pass tomorrow and expect to happen in the next year. But in the, over a few years, this is something that uh, with deliberate and intensive um, investment you can, you can build. And then my my final question is in regards to. Um, 
the benefits cliff. It's something you mentioned at the end of your presentation yesterday. Uh, um, and obviously there's an interest to try to mitigate that benefits cliff. Do you, have you uh, helped to identify how we could potentially mitigate that? So the, the benefits right now, um, as we modeled, every one of our scenarios provides benefits up to 500 times the poverty level. And to just give you a sense of what that, that means, so a family of three, that's $115,150 a year in 2022 dollars. For a family of five, that's $162,350. So that, under our current schedule, they would be subsidized in some way un until that. Ab above 500,000, uh, above 500%, uh, then it, it would be no, no subsidy. Um, to kind of give you a sense of what that is, the average Vermont household income is about $89,000. Um, the middle third of the U.S. households uh, with children under 18 is between 60 and 130,000. So we're talking about you know a good a good chunk of it. Mm -hmm. Another way to think about it is that um, if you look at the 500% threshold that we model, that's going to cover 80% of children under five in Vermont. So they would get some sort of of, uh, of subsidy. Um, if you maintain the current system that does 3.5% of poverty, uh, 3.5 times poverty, um, that is covers about 60% of children on, under five in Vermont. So the, the higher ones cover a substantial, the vast majority of children in Vermont, but there will always be some people at the other, a higher end of the income who will not be subsidized. And can I just add on that point that these are schedules that we've assumed in, in part as illustrative of what the state could consider and what it would mean to go beyond, for example, the current threshold of 3.5 um, times poverty under the current um, subsidy system. And of course, you also have universal pre-K, which goes beyond <laughs> that level. So there are ways you know, that the to really mitigate any concern about where the benefits fall off, you can continue a schedule beyond five times poverty. Obviously, it's just going to add a, a need for more public revenue to make up for whatever you're assuming you know families can afford and what would be left over. So um, this um, was intended to show what a more generous subsidy system would look like, but not one that goes to 100% subsidy, for example. So there's some um, potential to go beyond even what we um, model in this report, um, but that's where the decisions are, you know, in terms of which um, families, how high would income go before um, the subsidy system would, would taper off or would end. And then within any given, family income level, what's the expectation of what families can afford to pay? Um, and so we've assumed, we've shown you schedules that, you know, in some cases it maxes at 10%, in other cases at lower incomes, it might be 4% or 6%. That schedule could always be shifted to expecting families to pay more, in which case the public sector would pay less. So <clears throat> it's important to view these estimates in the context of assumptions we've made about what's affordable for families. And those are something that, you know, as policymakers could be adjusted um, such that um, the expectation is that families would be paying more than what we've assumed, which means the public sector contribution um, would be less. So just wanted to emphasize that. Representative Dolan, are you? Yes. Great. So here's the line. We've got Representative Harrison, Representative Shy, myself, Representative Lindley, Representative Holcomb, Representative Page, and Representative <laughs> Dickinson. Just, just good. I think uh, it's Jim. Representative Harrison, sorry. So uh, a couple things. First of all, clarification of the current public $125 million. You said approximately of that is half of the state and half federal. I was a little confused. Does that include universal pre K? Yes. Yeah. Just yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, it's on page um, yeah. nine of the presentation. So, in, in the other part of that that we provide, um, I will be the first to admit we probably nibbled around the edges. As, you know, we've tried to put a little bit more dollars in a couple million here, a couple million there, as budgets have a lot. Um, so this 
is obviously much older. But given where we are, um, do you have any idea of, in terms of state subsidies and help for child care? Where does Vermont rank today? Are we not very generous? Are we, you know, the top 10% of the states? Uh, I mean, I'm just curious. We, we, we try to do it as best we can, but we're a small state. Um, so there are limits. So I'm just curious as to, um, you know, where we are today. That's have a, you it, looked at that? It's a great question. You, I, I'm not going to hazard a guess as yeah. percentages, but Dravon is actually on the more generous side. Um, so below 1.5 or below requires no contributions. Um, 1.5 uh, percent times poverty or below families that make that income have no contributions under the current system. Subsidies do go up to 3.5 times poverty. That's pretty generous, you know, in the grand scheme of things. And then also, uh, the subsidy does not depend on family size. So you don't necessarily pay more because you have more kids in the system. That's also a, a generous feature of the Vermont system. So those combined makes puts Vermont on the more generous side. Uh, Lynn, did you have more detail around that? Yeah, just a couple of other things. Um, so that means that the schedule that Vermont is using is relatively more generous um, in terms of total dollars that Vermont is is contributing to those subsidies relative to other states say on a per capita basis. Um, I'm not aware of any estimates like that that would allow you to do those comparisons. Um, the other thing to look at is the state um, pre-K program. Um, Vermont is one of just a handful of states that has a universal program, although Vermont because it's funding on a universal basis, 10 hours per week, that is lower than other states. For example, Oklahoma has a universal pre-K program, universal for all four-year-olds. That's a school day academic year program. So that's funding just four-year-olds, not threes and fours, but for a school day, school year. Um, so, and then even when states are funding programs like that, how much money, how much state funds are going in to the per child cost can vary considerably. Um, there is an annual report that compares states in terms of their pre-K programs, the number of threes and fours that are covered, um, and the amount of funding that goes um, into those programs. So that's another way to potentially compare Vermont. I will note that your neighbor in New Hampshire, where we've also done work, yeah. does not fund a, a pre-K program with state money. So it's one of about six or seven states now that do not have any state funded pre-K. So it gives you a sense of, of the range. Okay, and the other um, question I had, you, you came up with a, kind of an estimate, maybe 2,000 more people would and I'm exact, uh, estimating here because I know there's a, there's a range. Um, if you have a, a two parents and one's making sixty thousand a year, and they look at today's environment, it's not worth it for the other spouse to work and they stay home. And there's other reasons as well. So let's just say the other spouse has an opportunity to go into the market as well. And they are going to make sixty thousand, um, and so now you've got a combined income of one hundred twenty thousand. And if we limit it to ten percent, um, they're not going to pay more than twelve thousand. Um, but there are other factors now. Now they're in a little higher tax bracket. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they get lesser, uh, maybe no help on their um, education, property tax. Uh, I did have you factored in all those other. Um, equations to still, I mean, I hope we do gain workers, but I mean, there yes. are a lot of, it, it's not just the dollars and cents of, of paying for the child care, which exactly. is very expensive. Yeah, exactly. And um, so we did model, for example, that you have an increase in tax revenue. Um, so that goes into our estimates of what would happen to the state uh, gross domestic or this gross state product, which would increase by, you know, 60 to over $200 million, depending on the scenario and the increased tax revenues that we talked about in terms of local and state um, tax revenues. So you, we take into account the kind of behavior changes that households would have once they, um, they are 
giving more wages because of the ECE, or there's more workers that enter and now making the wage, and that changes the kind of calculus of the, of the family finances. Okay, thank you. Yep. Great. Representative Shai, yeah. then myself. Thanks. I'm not sure you addressed these, but these questions are coming to me, uh, these issues that we'll have to address if you did not. And one of them is around governance. And did you, did you have any conversation about where this would be housed in state government? What kind of additional staff would be needed and the cost of that or any of that? Is, is any of that factored into this? That's not factored into this because we saw that kind of as an implementation where we read Act 45 as kind okay. of the what needs to be, what, what would be the right. required and not necessarily implemented. Though I do understand that Building Bright Futures Commission, the governance study prior to ours, um, and I think that report has some recommendations. So we also kind of saw that effort um, and said that's probably not something we need to do. Before. Okay, I just, it's somewhere. And, and, yeah. yeah, if I could just clarify, we do build in assumptions about administrative costs for the system. We did not expressly try to, you know, price from the bottom up, say either the new governance system that has been proposed or the existing governance system. Um, okay. But there we have made assumptions around um, having, you know, some core funding in there that recognizes there would be administrative costs. So we didn't try to figure out whether the revised governance would somehow be more efficient than the, the current system. Okay, so that's not in the 258 million, basically. It right, is so we, to the extent that we assumed a baseline of administrative costs really consistent with the current system rather than trying to factor in any changes in administrative costs because of uh, a shift in governance. And if we Absolutely. want to read more about that governance piece, we should find the Building Bright Futures report. Is yes. that what you're saying? Yeah. Correct. Okay, yes. we'll find that. Yeah, they came out last July or somewhere around last yes. July, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Thank you. Great, thank you. I, I just have one point that I just want to make sure that I'm understanding deeply, which I think I do, but you, that you're here. The state of Vermont has, we were talking earlier today, you know, that we're trying to address a lot of crises that in response to Vermonters' everyday life and, their, and what we've heard for many, many years is the, the um, conundrum around child care, lack of child care, low pay, how do we step in and start this in a new way? So, so our goal or problem that we're trying to solve is the crisis on child care. And their and its solution will hopefully have positive benefits within the greater economic world. But our goal is to not try to provide economic growth in the world through providing child care. I just want to make sure that we're trying to solve the child care problem, which to this point does not have any negative effect in any other area, but may have an incredible lift in those areas as well. You can't measure that, can you? Well, I would say that the charge of Act 45 was a high quality ECE system. System. So when when I when when I think people like us hear something like that, it's beyond it's childcare in the sense that you are educating the child even at a very young age from zero to five in ways that support their development intellectually and emotionally, right? Um, so it's it's beyond having an even nurturing adult in the room. It's about how does that adult interact with, in ways that support child development. And so that's the kind of system that we, that we priced out. So I was trying to get to the very simple question of like, I own a business and if I help with childcare, will, will I benefit from it, meaning in some way? And I would imagine, so, yes. Yeah, so we looked at it in aggregate. Um, and yes, there are some other benefits that we did not cost out such as Perhaps uh, women or, or the family would work longer because now they have more stable childcare, or they have to, or they're there and there's less distractions because the childcare emergencies are fewer. Those types of things are not necessarily in the report. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that that happens, and that could potentially also be Because I hear from me just personally too, from employers as well as families, and we all know that there's a boondoggle that we're trying to unwind. 
All right, thank you. Uh, Representative Bloomley. And then yes. Representative. Thanks very much. Um, and I heard something yesterday that I think is interesting. In your testimony that um, indicated that you've done a lot of report, you've done similar reports mm -hmm. for other states mm -hmm. or maybe even this, I don't know, um, but other entities. Um, and other people have done this, other organizations have done this too. And a lot of what's in a report like this are, I mean, there are assumptions that are made, right, about, um, and so you're modeling things. And I'm just wondering what you've learned through your own experience. Uh, as Rand um, and through understanding the literature in the field, it's like <clears throat> how accurate have those assumptions been? Um, uh, well, so Lynn has been actually the leader of many of those studies, and so I'll I'll, I'll let her. She has the best vantage point for for that type of question. Um, well, first of all, just acknowledge that indeed these kinds of analyses do involve assumptions. Um, Everything from you know what um, do what constitutes quality, um, and the relationship between quality and and children's um, development, school readiness, and subsequent success in school, um, to assumptions about what incomes families have, um, and um, you know how they're going to respond in terms of the labor market based upon changes in childcare subsidies. Um, we do draw on, I think um, the strongest literature is around um, identifying what constitutes quality in early care and education, um, what those features are and what they cost. So I think there's a lot of confidence around those numbers. Um, one of the areas that um, we note, and even in the report and in the appendix, you know, the one of the weakest areas is our understanding of how families respond to changes in childcare prices. Um, so what might happen, for example, in their response around labor force participation. And that's one of the reasons we give you a range of estimates there. Um, so in, at an estimate you know, that says 600 workers to several thousand, that it reflects the fact that there's uncertainty in our estimates of um, the responsiveness of um, parents, either, um, you know, the major earner in the family or the secondary earner in terms of whether they would choose to work or not based on a reduction in the cost uh, that they face for, for child care. So that's an area where there's more uncertainty. And so we give you that, that range, recognizing that, you know, there, it could be at that lower bound all the way to that, that upper bound. Um, likewise, um, I think in terms of uh, the way that the system would work in terms of subsidies, those are things that states have experience with, um, the ability to administer those subsidies. Um, we have systems you know, already in place, the kind of modifications that might be required, that's quite well known. So I think in terms of, you know, is this a feasible system that one could um, implement? We have more confidence there because these are systems that build on what exists already, either in Vermont or in other parts um, of the country. Um, I, I could turn it over to um, our colleague Aaron just to talk a little bit about the larger, what we call study two in the economic forecast. Um, but there again, you know, we're building on decades of work in that area. So maybe, um, Aaron, if you want to just say a few words about, you know, the, the level of confidence in the assumptions and modeling that we have there, I think that would be helpful for people to hear. Sure. So, uh, the models that we're, we're using, um, we use two different models to, to think about sort of the macroeconomic impacts of macroeconomic and sort of state revenue impacts. The first is what's known as an input output model. And that's really, if you, if you hire somebody to do an economic impact analysis, that's usually what they're going to use. And so they've been around since the thirties. We have a lot of confidence in those models for marginal changes in, in, in the economy you know, adding an additional hotel, what is the economic impact? That, that's a, a lot of what those models are used. We've also built up a, a, a more complex model that allows for, for greater substitution. Um, and those models have been around, you know, 40, 50 years and have just gotten better because of computing power. Um, it's, it's, we, we have really good confidence in these 
if the uh, if the underlying assumptions or sort of the inputs to them are correct. And sort of that's the other, th that's the big piece. The other way that we sort of validated our results was we worked with the JFO, sort of our initial results on how much revenue would be generated by this tax or that tax. We worked with the, the JFO to say, you know, are our estimates in line with what they would have estimated given a different set of data? And they were in sort of a, a, a rough order of magnitude. You know, is it 84? Is it 86? Those to me are, are, are roughly the same number. So, so we've done that validation step to say, to, to use different data to say, do we get the same results out? Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Representative Holcomb, then Representative Page, Representative Dickinson, Representative Tolino, and then we'll, we're done. We have a, our next witness coming in at 11.30. We get a moment to stretch. Go ahead. So I, I understand the focus of the report on demand side subsidies. That's what you were asked to do. And I also understand that it's something familiar from an implementation perspective. But in my own experience, sometimes when you move from a targeted program that's reactive to an identified need to a system at scale, keeping the same model can have unanticipated consequences. So for example, when we rolled out the universal pre-K vouchers, we added significantly to the resources available for pre-K, but we lost 7% of the childcare capacity in the state mm -hmm. in the same window. Mm -hmm. and, and so what I would like to know um, is what do you identify as the risks of a demand side model, particularly in a state that has an extremely constrained labor supply, so, so tight that literally families are hiring the teachers out of child cares because it's cheaper to hire the teacher to be your nanny than it is to send your child care right now. That's how bad it is. And um, what are those potential risks of demand side subsidies and what is being done in other places, particularly places that are trying to move to the scale that we're contemplating around other ways to provide resources to support this sector? I've read interesting things about contracting um, directly with providers, for example. What are other things that we should be asking as custodians of the state's precious wallet to try to make sure that we're getting the most value for the dollars for the families and the children that need them. Lynn, did you want to? Yeah, happy to um, address that. So um, indeed, I think one thing that I was going to say earlier and didn't get a chance is part of the way that um, the issue around a recruiting and retaining a workforce is through the improved compensation that we have have modeled. Um, so one of the challenges now is that compensation is so low that the alternatives, whether it's working at Walmart or being a nanny, look attractive to our, you know, the skilled qualified workforce that you have rather than working in, say, a center-based setting. Um, and so with the kinds of um, increases in compensation, both cash compensation and benefits, I think that that is um, a strategy certainly that most other states are investing in as a way to address the workforce challenge. Now, how do you enforce, for example, a compensation schedule like we proposed? Well, one solution is through the use of contracts. Um, so I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, and it's something that we make a reference to as well, which is how do you bring about some of these changes in the way in which you want the workforce to be compensated in the way providers are reimbursed um, to recognize um, that you want any increase in reimbursement to be directed toward the workforce and their compensation, not to buying other inputs into producing um, childcare. So, um, we make some references to that being a strategy. Be happy to provide you with others. There are good examples, I think, of where those strategies are being used um, to sort of change the way we think about um, the set of providers, how they um, relate to the both the public and private sectors and supporting a mixed <laughs> delivery. So even Vermont in instituting universal pre-K has tried to do that by allowing qualified private providers to participate mm -hmm. 
in that funding stream. And so um, to the extent that that's not being successful, looking for strategies that provide for better integration of both public schools and private providers delivering the pre-K program, whatever it looks like, um, you know, those are things as well to pay attention to. And I think where you can learn from other states and localities in terms of what they're doing. Good. Representative Page. Uh, yes, uh, just a couple of questions. Um, when you discussed wages earlier, um, those standardized wages, will they be the same throughout the state or will there be different uh, rates in different areas of the state? So we modeled in that average wage and then underlying that average is a distribution. Some would be paid less and some would be paid more. And, and often that's tied to cost of living. So you would expect perhaps in the more rural parts of the state where cost of living might be less, those wages might be a little bit less. In more urban parts of the state, those wages would be more. So we kind of assumed that the market conditions would, would have some in, impact. But when we cost it out, we say all of that variation is going to become in those averages. And that's what we showed you. So there is some variation. And um, Representative Shai raised the issue about governance that covering this report, uh, which I had a concern with, whether it would be under the Department of Education or some other entity, as well as whether we'd have to create new facilities for this system as well, which wasn't recovered in this report, it's under, I guess, the Let's Grow Kids report. Right, we didn't look at the, whether you, you'd have need more facilities. If there's a higher care, you probably would need more facilities. There's, different ways you can go about that. Um, one thing that came up in, in a past committee meeting is it's been declining school enrollment, and so some schools have empty spaces, and so for um, a modest investment of retrofitting those, those can become um, early child care facilities. So you kind of have to look at the total facility use in the state and see where there maybe is some places where you can kind of reallocate them in addition to potentially building more. Okay. And then finally, I, I, I heard uh, on the way in work this morning and, and last evening that there's a report on Vermont's educational uh, testing scores that uh, the trend has gone down over the last few years and I guess it's actually um, throughout the country uh, those trends have gone down. With such a program that, that you're suggesting put forward in other states where there is such a program, what effect has it had on um, you know, changing, uh, you know, our testing standards. Sure. So I would say that the, a lot of media attention that's happened because of those decreases in test scores throughout the country has been primarily because of COVID. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the NAEP, the, the kind of national uh, the test, um, we've seen historic de decreases in student achievement throughout the country because of just the disruptions in learning that the past few years have, have happened. Um, when it comes to early childhood programs, there is this phenomenon we see where there's a, often a short-term boost in test scores. And over time, many, maybe not all, but in many cases, those kind of fade out. But then we also see longer term, even after those test scores have fade out, that you have longer term favorable outcomes, like longer, they stay in school longer and achieve more education, um, and you, you uh, get pay, better paying jobs in the future. So um, I would say that there is this kind of fade out test score that the, the, uh, the field is trying to grapple with. Why does that happen? Um, part of the reason might be that um, you are, are supporting whole child development, right? So there could be the academics that other people catch up with. But if you're developing the whole child in early preschool, you, you build competencies that test scores do not measure that then show up in these longer term outcomes. Um, others, some really new work shows that maybe even the highest quality of them preserve test score advantages for longer than we thought of. So that's an area of active uh, uh, research in, in the field. Um, I would say that um, test scores are obviously mean a lot, a lot of baked into it, but they're not everything. Um, and so part of the reason why we think early, early childhood uh, education is a good investment is because whether or not in the long-term test score change because of it, there are these other kind of consequential 
uh, aspects of child development that have tangible uh, consequences for the, the child that pop up later on. Okay, thank you. Great. One minute. Well, we've got two two questions. All right. So, Representative uh, Dickinson, be quick, and then Representative Tolino, and then we were we were. All right. Okay, I'll make this quick. Um, one of the things you mentioned in the report, at least in the summary part that I read, because I haven't read it all, but one of the things you mentioned is the rural nature of our communities. Uh, we had a blue ribbon uh, commission maybe six, eight years ago. Uh, this also relates to governance. It was decided to put it in education and human services together. From what I understand, listening to people, it hasn't worked out that well. But we went from, we, we ended up with our new criteria and all of the, you know, it was like the, the perfect was, a, uh, good was destroyed by the perfect, basically. Right. We lost a lot of home care providers who do, in fact, provide a lot of care, or had previously provided a lot of care, especially in rural areas. Um, you mentioned that briefly. What exactly did that, how did that fit into your model? So what, if you, if you look at the distribution of the size of, of child care uh, centers and family child care homes, in Vermont, they are smaller than a lot of other states, particularly because Vermont has a large rural, um, substantial rural population. Um, and so what that ends up happening is that uh, they usually cost more per child, right? Because you're unable to spread the costs of running a center across a higher enrollment. Um, and so what we do is we kind of bake that cost into it. So, so these costs that we say kind of take into the distribution the size of the facilities, which are often smaller because of rural areas, but we assume compensation that would be fair and keep all the, the quality targets the same so that people have the, a good education no matter where they are in the state. But that is kind of baked into our cost estimate. Okay, the other thing is the educational level of the people who run these things. Some Correct. of them don't meet those educational. Well, our model assumes that the, the people working with them have that bachelor's we'll and associate's degrees. Oh, okay. Okay. Exactly. okay, thank you. Great. Representative Tolino. I will pass so that they can get to it. Oh, aren't we sweet? Nice. I was, I was oh. going to remind the good men or the good uh, uh, <laughs> Nolan that we're we have, we have now absorbed the lateness and turning it around on time. So I would like a little check on our credit box that says <laughs> we fix things again. That says, yes, because we may need to pull that out and, yeah, okay. and, and need our own time back, back sometime. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We can go offline. Welcome back to the Vermont House Appropriations Committee. It is Thursday, January 19th, 2023. We're back in at 11.30 after a little short stretching break. And uh, we have with us, uh, we're gonna hear on the uh, Budget Adjustment Act from Public Safety. They have a, a couple of short things, but before we do that, Representative Harrison has some, is gonna report on reports. Yeah, I just wanted to keep up as we the chair mentioned last week there's a lot of reports that will come to us uh, pretty much fast and furious uh, right about now. Um, and there was one at the end of last week that I've already passed on to Representative Shy, um, but I don't think I mentioned it in committee, and that was uh, the Act 163 State Appraisal and Litigation Assistance Program Cost Estimate, uh, which is on our website. And then um, this morning, uh, Aaron passed on two reports, but they're the same area. And it's basically the 2023 tax expenditure reviews. And I assume that goes to Representative Shai as well. Thank you. Um, as I think probably everyone is aware, um, tax expenditures kind of is numbers put together by a joint fiscal office on um, um, if we have an exemption from taxes for something there's another way to call that as an expenditure because we would have otherwise got foregone, foregone revenue. revenue so yeah that's a good way to put it anyhow so there is on there and because representative Representative Shai loves these reports. I'm going to forward them to her. Thank you. You are. And everybody should read them. It's very interesting. Oh, it is yeah, very interesting. It is. 
Is that it, sir? That's Great. it. We, we have the benefit of having I, two I members who, who Thank you. had their teeth cutting in, in ways and means before they arrived here, so they're, they're very familiar with that. So, um, I just, Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner. 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 Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so, you haven't met all of us yet. No, ma'am, I have not. I know Representative Brennan from way, way back, uh, and I know. Uh, we won't ask her. about that. <laughs> so, what, why don't we introduce ourselves? All right, and then and then you can introduce yourself and your team, and then we'll hear what you have to say about budget adjustments. So, um, I'll start. I'm representative of Diane Lanfer, live in Virgins, and I represent Addison Three. All right, we'll go. Robin's here. Okay. Back. So I'm Robin Shy, and I'm from Middlebury. Welcome. Pat Brennan, Colchester. Just Lonely Burlington. Kristen Tolino, Bradford. Carrie Dolan, <coughs> Duxbury, Faced in Martown, Waitsfield, and Walton. <coughs> Lynn Dickinson, St. Albans Town. Hi, I'm Mark Mahali, uh, Plainfield, Marshfield, and Callis. Uh, Trevor Squirrel, Underhill, and Jericho. Woody Page, Newport. Jim Harrison, Chittenden, Menden, Kellington, and Pittsfield. Good morning. Rebecca Holcomb, Sharon Norwich, Stratford, and Thetford. Nice to see you. Thank you. And I think you've interacted with our committee assistant, Aaron, Aaron and, and JFO Maria. So please. Oh, yes. yeah. So thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Jennifer Morrison. I'm the Commissioner of Public Safety. Uh, and I don't need a whole team when I have my director of finance, uh, Rick Hallenbeck, with me. So That's we are a dynamic duo today. If you, if there's information that you need that we don't have, we have people on standby on the call <laughs> the screen for what should be a relatively straightforward uh, discussion. So with that, I will let Rick introduce himself and uh, take things away. Sure. I am, um, for the record, I'm Rick Hollenbeck. I'm the Director of Finance and Administration at Public Safety. And uh, Madam Chair, if uh, please with you, I'll go through these two lines on the budget adjustment form. Great. And I see we have someone else. Who, oh, that's not with you. He's with the administration, but he's with us all. Mm Hi, -hmm. Josh. Okay, go ahead. Walk us through your changes. Line, the large number, uh, $3.3 million up cost the new uh, Vermont Troopers Association collective bargaining agreement. Uh, change the pay charts to an 8% increase over the previous pay chart. So this represents the salary and all those related items that are based off of uh, the sal salary or hourly rate, such as overtime, um, the standby pay, and also the shift differential rates were increased in both the ETA contract and the uh, the state's uh, bargaining agreement uh, with civilians, the supervisory and non um, All of those, including the VTA, had changes in the shift differential rates. And I'll pause there in case there's any questions on that. Oh, Representative Shai has a question. So does Mr. Harrison. Oh, Harrison, okay. I, oh. Uh, I'm just wondering how many, um, how many individuals are in this collective bargaining agreement? Association, I believe the number is 334. Okay, thank you. That's not true. That's our that's our sworn that's the number of sworn positions. There are a few positions in uh, senior management that would not be in the, the VTA. State police lieutenants have, I believe, uh, supervisory bargaining. So, if you would like, um, about three hundred. It's about three hundred in the Troopers Association, approximately. Okay. Thank you. Representative Harrison, if you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Rick. Um, but you mentioned the. The adjustment here for the Pay Act was about 8% of your total uh, appropriation for state police. Is that what I'm understanding? 
50% of the total appropriation, it's the pay chart that shows their hourly rates. So say you're on a particular step and you have a particular hourly rate, the new pay chart represents exactly an 8% increase over that previous rate. If, if I could just interrupt you, we're, we're getting a little uh, garbling on the voice. I don't know um, if, if it's something with your microphone or, or what. Um, so um, just be cognizant of that or pass the baton to the commissioner. Um, so I was led to believe, or my understanding was, that when we did the Pay Act in last year's budget, the troopers contract was not uh, settled. So I thought human resources kind of put an estimate in there um, because obviously we couldn't keep extending the session. And um, so I, I don't know what they ended up putting in there, but I thought they were looking at whatever the state employees was and then if that was four percent they put that in and then um, whatever was resolved which was more uh, we had to put the difference in but do you do you recall that in terms of what was actually allocated for troopers or should we get that from dhr yeah i don't have that figure representative if you could i could uh be happy to reach out to dhr and get that if you if you'd like well, I'm just I'm just trying to understand what what pay rate change was made for the troopers with the contract. Was it eight percent? In FY twenty three, it is eight percent. In FY twenty four, it will be two percent from there. Okay, and did it include the uh, one time payment that uh, I think was in the BSA BSEA contract as well? No, I, it's, it doesn't have the one-time payment the way the civilian contracts do. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sure. I feel like Representative Harrison, I know this is your budget and you've got, it feels like you've got some questions that you're, you're gonna yeah, go no, we'll, search. We'll, we'll, we'll get that information from okay. DHR. Um, so, yeah. I didn't get the number that they actually put in here for an estimate as part of the total. Yeah, so you're trying to tie up that there was money that there, there was already yeah. there yeah. and you're just wondering, is this on top of that? Well, yeah, or is this, exactly, because I'm looking at the 3.3 million, which is about 8% of the 46. So maybe I'm looking at the wrong numbers. Well, we, we wouldn't want that to happen. No, uh, no, but that's all I have yeah, in, the, yeah, uh, exactly. in, in the crosswalk that was sent over. Okay. So we can follow up, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Thank okay. You. And then there's only one other line item, which is the vacancy savings. Yes, we due to vac uh, vacancies and recruitment difficulties in both the uh, sworn ranks and in our PSAPs. Um, as of Monday, we had 23 vacancies in the PSAPs and 40 vacancies on the sworn side. Uh, so with some how many on, I'm sorry how many on 23 vacancy savings in the PSAPs and how many in the other uh, there were 40 as of Monday on the sworn side 48 40 on the 40. Side. 40, 40, 40. <laughs> sorry if my microphone isn't isn't cooperating all right can you repeat that Four zero. Four zero. On, for on what side of the 23 was on what I got 20 PSAP, but what was the 44? What is that? Troopers. Sworn troopers. Sworn officers. Thank you. <laughs> so we have so we have 40 vacancies in the troopers, and right now out of a force of 300. 330. 330. Okay. Yeah, they're not. It's a, it seems like it's it's high. I'm sorry. You know, I know you know that. Like, um, it was 50 as on Sunday, and then we started a class of 10 troopers in pre-basic training on Monday. Now, of note, 
they you won't all make 40 it. vacancies, but they're all still in one position number until they finish the academy. So if you were to check HR numbers, you'd still think we have 49 vacancies, right, okay. as of Monday. But in terms of who we're paying, we have 40 vacancies. <clears throat> and we're not 100% sure all of them will make it through training, right? That's correct. But we're rooting for them. Of course we are. And we're <laughs> earnestly so are we. recruiting for the next class. <laughs> I should be. So the 23 vacancies in the PSAPs help us to understand um, sure. we, how many total? So what 66. is it? 66. 66 so total I, positions in the two PSAPs in Westminster and Williston. Those are the public safety answering points, which are 911 uh, uh, call taking seats, but also dispatching for all of, you know, police, fire, and EMS. Um, so of 66 positions, we currently have 23 uh, vacancies. So the impact on the workload on the number that's left is enormous. It's terrible. And it's a lot of long, you know, forced over time. Uh, the more, the more higher a vacancy rate you carry, the more, the quicker you lose people because they can't get right. any time off. And, you know, right. it's that it's the cycle. The spiral. Yep. Um, yes. Because you don't have a lot more other than these two lines, correct? Correct. Right. So can you can you take a moment to tell us about what um, what's out there for the recruiting for this? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, on the civilian side of the house, we obviously follow the general uh, human resources uh, protocols and advertise the positions. A lot of the positions seem to get filled by word of mouth. That, which makes it even more incumbent upon us to create a decent work-life balance for our existing employees. Um, and we, we have a very high turnover rate. Retention is very hard in the PSAPs, and that is one of, <clears throat> one, of, one of many drivers of our push, our significant push to make regional dispatch come to fruition. We currently dispatch for approximately 100 agencies out of those two PSAPs, and the complexity of work is too high. And we hear that consistently in our exit interviews with employees who are leaving. Um, and then, as I mentioned already, when we get low on staff, people get forced into overtime shifts. They don't have a lot of control over their schedule and it <laughs> causes people to say, this is not for them and I, and, and I, I get it. Um, so on the recruiting front on the PSAP side, we, we, we sell those vacancies the same as we do for any other vacancy other than troopers. Um, for sworn personnel, we have engaged in several new initiatives, marketing campaigns. Uh, we've received some consulting input. Uh, we have engaged in some contracts with WCAX and other um, traditional media platforms. We have begun advertising at historically black colleges and universities. Um, we have been taking our recruiting efforts uh, to states and places and cities where we've never Mm. put our initiatives. We've hired a civilian recruitment uh, specialist who is very, very adept at um, digital media. And he has been creating a lot of content for uh, social media sites and the places where younger people far younger than I would be likely to find their uh, information on um, TikTok and other things. <clears throat> Instagram. Um, so we've been aggressively recruiting, but I would be remiss if I didn't say this is not a Vermont problem. This is a nationwide problem. It is um, it is an unbelievably difficult landscape uh, to recruit in. Um, our, our retirements and departures are outpacing the ability to bring people in the door. And even once we do, ma'am, it's about, it's about a year before an officer can get out on their own in a car and answer calls for service without being supervised. So. It's a long time of training, and so that we are we're going to be wrestling with this for probably the next three to five years at least. Well, let me ask this: the um, the uh, potential uh, regional dispatching centers that are under development. I, I don't know where it is in the development, but in places, some places are farther ahead than others. Is there an expectation then with those that 66 um, and the PSAPs will be reduced 
I mean, number of people or just the stress? Uh, well, first off, the, the stress and complexity of the work would absolutely be reduced if we can find the right um, workload balance, right? Yes. If we can right. if we can find the right distribution of personnel. And, and by moving to a d diffuse regional model, of course, you're able to tap into different work pools, workforce pools, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we don't know if the 66 will be reduced because we don't know how many oh, agencies we will shed. Uh, but certainly that would be a topic of ongoing analysis and discussion that if we are able to get to a point where we can shrink uh, the number of people required to run the two PSAPs, right. that would result in some level of cost savings that could theoretically be put back into the regional dispatch effort. I, w I know that we're standing between lunch on this, but you know, I just wanted you to hear that we're concerned. We know that this crisis is there. Vermonters' safety is paramount, and having a really good functioning system. So, I know that this whole building would, you know, has a great deal of sympathy and would want this to succeed. Well, I, we do too. <laughs> no one wants. Uh, this more, I mean, you know, when you think about, you just, we want somebody to be there to answer the phone when citizens in distress or visitors in distress call. And likewise, we want yeah. somebody to be there to answer the radio when first responders need something, need something for their safety or to help the safety of other people. We are in a bit of a, a moment, shall we say, right now, this, this legislative session, we have $20 million that can potentially be in play to assist these centers with getting up and running, yep. Yep. but we have to answer the two, two fundamental questions the governor is seeking an answer to. One is, is a statewide system of emergency responders communication a fundamental obligation of state government? If the answer is yes, that's a very different path from the path mm -hmm. that we have been on for the last three years. <clears throat> and the other question is related to funding. How? What is the long-term funding? So we know we have projects that are willing to become regional centers, but they will not invest money, time, and human resource into the planning and all the, the work that needs to be done to get there until they know what the back-end funding is in the long-term. So, you know, I think the biggest challenge right now is determining the long-term funding and what is an equitable way of paying for this service across the state. So are you an intricate part of that conversation with them? Yes. Good. How's it going? <laughs> We're at a crossroads. I mean, we are. We really are. It's a, it's a, um, it's a logical pause because we were approved uh, for funding from the Joint Fiscal Committee for uh, two, approximately $2 million to get some projects moving. But in that same lump of money was money to hire a technical consultant on contract and a project manager on contract. Those RFPs are on the street and responses are due tomorrow. So then of course there would be the inevitable review and determining if we're going to engage with someone. So we have like this kind of two week timeout while things settle on that front. And I, I know the governor wants the legislature's help in answering these really fundamental big <clears throat> questions. Right. But I would be remiss if I did not s express the sense of urgency that this has been studied to death over 55 years. The report after report after report has come to the same conclusion that a system of regional centers is right for Vermont. Yeah. How we get there and how we fund it in the long term, the long term funding is really the key. So we, we, we should not miss this opportunity. We have received the congressionally directed spending from Leahy's office to the tune of $9 million. Of course, your committee was a big bill. <laughs> H740 last year, at the 11. There was an 11 million appropriation in two different chunks. So it's it, now's the moment. Well, I've now taken up enough time that we have two other questions, Representative Harrison and then mm -hmm. Representative Dickinson, and then we're going to go to lunch, okay? Yeah. And Commissioner, I certainly do want, want to be the guilty one of uh, delaying lunch because that's very important to mm -hmm. me and others. But. Um, you know, as you know, last year we set up a study group of the various stakeholders. And I don't know how, I wasn't involved with that, so I, I, I probably <clears throat> mischaracterizing it, but it sounded like it was sort of like a meltdown of 
that process because there is no recommendations. Uh, and um, we can talk further, but um, we, we kind of need, I guess, a little bit uh, more buy-in from all the various groups to, to get somewhere, wherever that somewhere is. So um, any comment on that stakeholder group? I don't know if you were involved with it or if some of your people were. Yes, some of my people were, and it was, um, you know, it was it was ours to turn in the report, but it was supposed to be a report crafted by this working group, which, you know, with many working groups, these are folks for whom that's another thing on their plate, and they're not being compensated for the time to come to the extensive meetings, etc. So those groups are inherently difficult at times. Um, and I recognize that the recommendations they made were not the one magic bullet. They they concluded after talking to a wide variety of experts across the state that um, they could not come up with a recommendation that did not result in an, a new tax or fee. And that was what they were challenged to do. Uh, and so the question is, can you guys come up with something that's not a new tax or fee? Because the working group sure couldn't. <laughs> And it was a it was a great group of people, but yeah, there was definitely a strong difference of opinion that the that some people in the group thought that we had to answer different questions, and they didn't want to stay on task with what the assignment from the piece of legislation was. So, mm -hmm. you know, we got a laundry list, of, an a la carte menu of recommendations, not a one top level recommendation. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Representative Dickinson, take us home. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I remember a few years back that there was a lot of um, controversy over the idea of regionalizing or cutting back the uh, dispatch centers. I think we were going to go to two. Um, I'm not sure where we are now. Um, it sounds like it's sort of being regionalized, but never quite got there. Where are we? How many do we have? So what you're referring to is that we had four state-run PSAPs. They um, con were consolidated from four to two uh, by some of my predecessors. Um, that has created some very difficult circumstances in terms of reducing the available workforce to pull from um, and, and increasing the complexity of the work that I just described about the number of agencies being dispatched out of two PSAPs. Uh, where we are in the Vermont landscape looks like this. There are many uh, municipalities and sheriff's departments who have always dispatched for themselves or perhaps for their own fire and rescue as well, like South Burlington, Burlington, Colchester, et cetera. Those entities continue to operate today and I don't know what their future looks like if we went to a fully regionalized scheme. Um, there are de facto regional dispatch centers, although they are not, they have no official imprimatur of such, but for instance, in Shelburne, the Shelburne Police Department contracts with approximately 15 or more other agencies. Uh, they have their own governance system and they have their own uh, scheme for paying fair share. Likewise, in St. Albans, they dispatch for more than 30 uh, entities up that way. Same thing. They have a different way of charging customers than what Shelburne uses. And both of those are different from how the Lamoille County Sheriff's Office, who is also a de facto regional dispatch center, they all charge differently, but they all appear to have pretty good customer service success. They're, they have happy customers. Um, the biggest issue is that we have inequity across the state in that many agencies that are in being dispatched by our PSAPs don't pay, and they never have. And so they have no incentive to go to a new model that would require them to pay. Oh, we've heard um, for them. Yeah, I, I'm sure. And I get it. Like it, it's, uh, you know, as a former police chief, uh, dispatching is a big chunk of your operating budget, but it's also necessary if you're going to deploy emergency responders to situations. So, and answer phones <laughs> from the public. Yeah. So that's where we are is that there's a very, um, there's a big disparity of the types of center that exist. The two formal state-run ones are a consolidation of the previous four, four PSAPs. And then we are um, surrounded by either standalone dispatch entities in municipalities and these de facto regional entities who have figured out a way to make it maybe profitable, but at least cost neutral by taking on other customers. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Well, we will let you go. It was great that you had a very simple one because we get to take a, take a moment to talk about other things. So thank you for your time yes, and your yeah, testimony. You and Representative Harrison has your budget. And so uh, you, you, you can uh, follow up with him and he can do the same. All right. You are, you are good to go. Thank you. So, committee, it is exactly 12 o'clock.